All right, so this was a Calc 2 antiderivative. You probably figured it out by either you either knew it or you looked somewhere in chapter 8, probably 8.3. I looked in the brief table of integrals. It wasn't. Or you can look in the brief table of integrals, <laughs> which is probably not brief enough to make it on your cheat sheet. No. <laughs> <laughs> Unless you write incredibly small. It's just, I just randomly write down all forms involving a squared minus x squared. Oh. All right, so we're going to go on to the next problem. So we got three more of these to go. <coughs> so we got x square root 1 minus y dx minus square root 1 minus x squared dy equals 0. This one should be, uh, should have a slightly easier antiderivative. So you do have to spend a little more work separating here. So this is not distributed or separated correctly for integration. So you gotta get your x's with your dx, your y's with your dy. So to go ahead and do that, and then find the antiderivative. And I'll give you a minute head start. And probably pass you, unless you hurry.
So I'm going to copy over my differential equation just so I have the original preserved and I'm not messing around and trying to do too much with the original. So I made some pretty big mistakes. I think I failed at adding one. Which I'm pretty sure was the thing I told you. The main problem with the power anti-power rule is not adding one correctly. My, this form of the solution, everything's negative. I can multiply by negative one pretty easily. Now I sort of cheated with my constant. I didn't multiply my constant by negative one. But remember, it's just a constant. So if you want, you can call this negative C, but it's just some other constant. So if you multiply a constant by a number or add a number to a constant or take a constant to a power, you still get a, a new constant. So you don't have to write down what you're doing to your constant. I'm just going to use that last form right there. I could solve for y pretty easily. It's not that hard to do. But that's just algebra. So this is an algebra class. So we'll leave it like this. Questions on any of these steps from beginning to end? <laughs> so we'll do our next problem. separate everything so very similar to the last problem you got to get your y's next to your dy your x is next to your dx and then integrate so do that right now you're going to be tempted to write tangent y but unless you know the antiderivative of tangent I will leave it as sine y over cos y and do a U sub.
I think I skipped any steps. I just divided by I squared x plus one. I mean, I wrote it differently, but that's one over squared root x plus one, right? But uh, 
So I multiplied by x plus 1 to the one, uh, negative 1 half power divided by cos y. That's what I multiplied by. Oh. Well, that makes sense now. Or you could say I divided by square root x plus 1. Either way. Alright, this is tangent right here. Antiderivative is ln of secant plus tangent. Is that right? Oh man. I guess I better integrate this thing. So u, yeah, cos y du negative sine y dy. So we got minus integral one over u du for that guy. And then this first one, I'm going to let u equal x plus one. And I better not use the letter u a second time to mean something different. So V works, so I'm just going to go with a W. You can really use any letter that you're not already using. And I recommend <laughs> avoiding the letters that are already in cosine and sine. So like C, O, and S are probably not good letters. You're going to use C later for a constant. So if W is X plus 1, regular X is w minus 1. So now I'm going to distribute the w, uh, square root w across. So we have w to the positive 1 half power minus w to the negative 1 half power. And second antiderivative, we can just do that one right now. It's ln u. Our constant on the right side. So we have ln cos y. And then the antiderivative of the w's is w to the 3 halves times 2 thirds minus w to the 1 half times 2. <coughs> all we have to do is get the W is back out. So we got <coughs> W is x plus 1, so we got 2 thirds x plus 1 to the 3 halves power minus 2 x plus 1 to the 1 half minus ln cos y equals c. It's not too hard to solve for cos or for y. Of course, your solution will have a cos inverse in it. But I'm just going to leave it like this again. When I ask you on uh, quiz or midterms to solve, you can give me the form that you get after you're done doing calculus. So you don't have to rewrite it, solve for the constant, or solve for y, or solve for some other random thing. If you want to check it, it's a different story. You'll probably need to figure out y prime when you want to check. But even to get y prime, you don't have to solve for y. You take a derivative and then solve for y prime. So we'll do our last example now. And this one will uh, come with a initial condition. So you should not have any constant at the end. It should be an actual number uh, value that you compute. <coughs> so our problem will be x, y squared dx plus 1 minus x dy equals 0. And our condition will be y of 2 equals 0. So let's just write down exactly what x and y are. So when you see y of 2 equals 0, which is x, 0 or 2? Two? 2 is our x, and that means 0 is our y. So our x, y are 2, 0. So separate this back out and solve it. Ooh.
add one to the power, divide by negative one. The other one's less easy, the x integral. And we'll probably that guy right there. You probably divided by y squared, but that's the exact same thing I did. I just multiplied by y to the negative two. Yeah, I just do one over y squared, but I should do one yeah. minus x. Well, you got to get the x away from the dy, or else I don't know what. I wrote y to the somewhere. Oh, that's a separate issue. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, don't forget about the initial condition. I'm zoomed in, so you can't see the initial condition, but I want my handwriting to be better, so I don't want to keep zoomed out so my letters look pretty. <coughs> What's that? With the Y? Oh no. Ooh. Does one work? <laughs> yeah. Alright, let's go with that. That's an easy number. The next easiest number. 
that oh man all right pick some <laughs> values that work i'm doing calculus Zero two. Yeah. All right, we'll do that. <laughs> the crowd gets what they want. by the definition of natural log is how a proper calculus student would answer that. Now, if you can't tell, having your constant on one side, it's already solved for C, so it's nice for plugging in your condition. It just saves you a tiny little bit of algebra at the end. So the correct answer to why ln of 1 is... One. This is the definition of natural log right here. The integral 1 over t from 1 to x in this case one to one. So that's the definition of it. I'm going to erase it in a minute, but I'll write the definition off to the side. So in case you didn't remember everything from calculus to this is a definition. So that's good old days calculus too. That's probably the first important thing. You learn the anti the Inverse derivative formula, and then this was the second thing. You could use the inverse function, as was stated earlier. You can always, of course, use properties as well. All right, so one minus a half. So that'll be one minus zero minus a half. So that is three halves. And now we'll just combine all this back together. This is our general solution. <laughs> so general is before you evaluate your constants and then so right there's general. So that's the one that you have to put on the test for this. Oh yeah. Absolutely. I'm really bad with numbers. Constant. And actually I should do So that's our particular. So these are all the easiest ODEs that we can solve. And I could have you could have solved these back in calculus 2. So now we're going to move on to the next type of ODE. So I recommend if you can separate it, you should do it. If you can separate it, this is the easy way to solve it, assuming you can actually do these antiderivatives. So most of the next problems that we do in the class won't be able to be separated. However, what you're going to find out is there's a lot of overlap, so there's going to be some separable ODEs that could be solved in the way I'm going to show you. And then the way I'm going to show you could be used to solve maybe exact ODEs. So there's going to be a lot of overlap as to how to solve different ODEs. So we're going to look at homogeneous coefficients. So we'll start with what in the world is a homogeneous function? <coughs> so if we have some function of x and y. 
So if this defines a function on region R, so we define regions somewhere back in, in chapter one through three. So a region was basically connected, connected subset that's open. I'm pretty sure that's basically how we defined it. Uh, F is a hom homogeneous of order n. if it can be written as <coughs> there's two ways it could be written and they're both going to be really similar so if it is x to a power uh, multiplied by a function of u where u equals y over x. Or if you could rewrite it in a very similar way where x and y are going to trade places. So you get y to the n and then some other function of u where u equals x over y. So first we're going to show that a function is homogeneous. First of all, we're going to have to decide, should we go with one or two? I think we should go with number one. Why, why is number one a better choice here? There's only one thing that indicates that one. But what about the natural log? It's already got a y over x in it. So that's why we're going to go with it right there. So I'm going with one only because I already see y over x. If I didn't have that, if it was just uh, x squared plus y squared, I can go either way. There was not one obvious choice to make. But because there's already a y over x, I'm going to just go that direction. So first thing we're going to do, let u equal y over x. <coughs> The other thing to notice about one, I need an x to the n out front. I don't see in my notes if n's supposed to be an integer. I I think it is supposed to be, but maybe in your book where they define homogeneous, they're a little more specific. All right, so. Okay, so I don't think n had, needs to be an integer here. So it really just needs to be a real number. That's a little bit different only because of the order n, because now you can have an order of 1 half or pi or something weird like this. So you can have weird orders that are not integers. All right, let's attempt to do this. <coughs> so I'm going to, it looks like we should bring an x squared outside, but we got a problem. How in the world do I factor an x squared out 
when I don't have one. So these are obviously not equal right now. So I just divide by what I want to factor out. So any questions on that move? And the reason I went with x squared is because I already saw an x squared. So I was hoping maybe this will work out. So what I need <coughs> is now a function of u. So I need to write <coughs> what I have in the box as a function of u. So I got my x to the n, or x squared here. So I need a function of u, and u is y over x. So I got, it's pretty obvious I got a u right there. That's ln of u, that's easy. I'll write that part down. What can I do to that part? That's u squared, right here. So g of u, is that the letter we use? Yeah, g of u is 1 plus u squared ln u. If you want to impress people with your natural log property skills, you could write u to the u squared, but that looks really ugly. I wouldn't do that. All right, what can I say? Homogeneous or not homogeneous? Homogeneous. Fits the form. It's order two. There we go. All right, questions before I give you an example to do yourself. What, why? One. Number one. Oh, the number one? one. That's fine. So all I needed over here was a function of u. As long, basically, as long as there's no x's in here, we're fine. And, well, there can't be x's or y's. It needs to be just a function of u. And what happened to that x yeah, that's the order. That term is, is this uh, order term out front. So you're basically factoring out a bunch of x's and until what you have left can be written as a function of y over x. Does that make sense? It has, yeah, basically it has u's in it. Uh, or Another way to think about this is you can, that's the right word, there's not, there's kind of a balance of x's and y's. Uh, if I didn't have this ln in here, that's pretty clear that x and y are kind of act the same in that. Uh, so in this case, I can just factor out an x squared or a y squared and go either way to show that it's homogenous. Uh, basically, it means x and y act in a similar way. Specifically means you can rewrite it in exactly this form here. Uh, there'll be consequences later when we take derivatives of these and see what types of, uh, what solutions this will lead to. So we're about to apply a huge amount of calculus. So it has to mean that? If you don't have homogeneous coefficients, the solution method that I'm going to derive won't be applicable. So we're just, separable is very easy to determine. Can you separate them, yes or no? and then you just integrate. Uh, if it's homogeneous, there'll be a way we can turn it into separable, but it will be separable in, uh, in this case, x and u, instead of x and y. So you'll see this, it'll make sense in a little bit. So I'm gonna give you two more functions. One is homogeneous, one is not. No, that may not be true. Maybe they're both homogeneous. <coughs> Determine homogeneous or not on these next two. Pretty sure I picked one yes and one no. And of course, not is not, you would just write not homogeneous. 
the heterogeneous doesn't that's not a term we use here you just say not homogeneous I think that's in science the opposite of homogeneous is I mean it's not opposite who knows We're not in science class all right f of x y equals square root y sine x over y so only using two brain cells should I go with one or two go with number two because you already see x over y so don't make things more complicated that's my job And you don't need to factor any y's out. You already see the y function at the front. So here's this example. Your order is 1 half. So in the second part, we call the h, uh, the function of u, h of u. <coughs> all right, so there's pretty much no difficult algebra at all on this one. It was almost in the perfect form already. So we got homogeneous. Yeah. Yeah. I pick easy questions to do in class and then pick easy to hard ones to put on your homeworks. All right, uh, next problem. Same exact, determine homogeneous. Uh, or not. So I don't see x over y or y over x. However, there is a more obvious choice to make. And I apologize for having to make this super small. Mm. Should I go with one or two? Mm. So it, because of that x squared, or that x to the n form, I would say go with choice one, because there's already an x to a power out front. I think we have a trig identity for sine times cosine. I think it. Oh no, we don't because the x and the y don't match. But the the angles don't match though. So that's making me nervous. It's not 2 sine x cos x, it's 2 sine x cos y. Do we have one for that? So it's more difficult to say something can't be written in a certain form because just because I can't write it in a certain form doesn't mean that it cannot be written in a certain form. Like I probably can't climb Mount Everest, but it doesn't mean it's not climbable. So, I'm going to say probably not, because I'm not sure how to put that into a function of u. Uh, now, I should write down, we went with choice 1, so that does mean that u equals y over x. I just don't see a way to combine this together to get into that form. So, I'm going to say probably not. Now that's not an okay math answer, so if this was a uh, part of a problem 
on a quiz or a midterm, I would probably try other methods of solution. Maybe it's separable. In fact, looking at this, this is a very nice separable function here. Very easy to separate x's and y's as products. So if this was one of my coefficient functions, I'd probably be going separable. This well, I have to, this is this is not a differential equation. It's just one function, but the kind of general setup. something like that basically so that would be my f of x right there and then I would just be dividing out by the y the cos y part all right so we're going to define the homogeneous ODE and then you can leave so obviously it's an ODE with homogeneous functions so we'll write it as p of xy dx plus q of xy dy equals zero. So if you get in this form, uh, now p and q have to both be homogeneous of order n. We'll, sh we'll see how to solve these tomorrow. And that'll take a little while to prove the theorem. And then we'll go ahead and solve a few problems after that. So any questions before I let you go? So the only real homogeneous questions you can answer now is, is the function homogeneous or not? Don't attempt to solve any homo. If they're not separable, don't worry about them on that next section of homeworks.